Good morning. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Today. It's good to see all of you as we come together here at the end of our Easter season. Uh, this Thursday will be Ascension, and so uh, that's when we sort of remember when Jesus uh, moved on to the next phase of his ministry, uh, ascending to the right hand of the Father, where he then continues to intercede for us and continues to work in building his kingdom. Uh, again, that'll be this Thursday, but we'll celebrate it next Sunday. So this is actually kind of the last Sunday of Easter. Uh, but as we've been going through and talking through all of Jesus' resurrection appearances, the times when he showed himself, revealed himself after his resurrection, and then starts to teach about what it's going to mean for them uh, as his resurrection sort of moves on into what we call the eschaton, the end, the last days. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more from that or about that today as Jesus in our gospel reading talks about uh, what he is going to uh, leave behind and how he's going to encourage his disciples. Uh, but in our message, we'll actually get to talk about something a little bit more grander as we start to look forward to what Jesus has in store for us uh, in that eschaton, again, in those last days. But with that, I invite you to rise. Turn and face the cross and the font as we begin our time here this morning. And we make our beginning here today in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. On another day, the one before he gave his life for us, our Lord said, In that day you will ask nothing of me, Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And today, this side of Easter, we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we cannot free ourselves from our sinning and our sinful condition. And so let us therefore ask our Heavenly Father for forgiveness for Jesus' sake. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Although Jesus foretold about the disciples scattering that very night, yet he said, I have said all these things to you that in me you may have peace. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, peace be with you. Amen. Amen. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. Our first reading comes from the book of Acts, the 16th chapter. In your pew Bibles, this can be found on page 925. Page 925. Acts 16, beginning with verse number 9. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women who had come together, and one who heard us was a woman named Lydia, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized, and her household as well, She urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading, or epistle reading, comes from the book of Revelation, the 21st chapter. In your pew Bible, this can be found on page 1041. Page 1041. You'll see there listed a number of verses, uh, including a nice big gap in between those verses, but we're going to go ahead and read the whole thing this morning. Beginning in verse 9, Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain, And showed me the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, twelve thousand stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb." 
By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to rise. Hallelujah. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Alleluia. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 16th chapter. This can be found in your pew Bibles on page 903, page 903. Jesus said, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, you will receive, that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. And now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. This is the gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. At this time, we invite the children to come forward for our children's message. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. Ooh, I like that. That's a good start. I want to ask you a question. I don't know that this question is a real answer, but I want you to think about it here for a moment. Have you ever been asked by your parents to go somewhere and do something that you didn't really want to do? Yes? Okay, well, some people are nodding. They have a very clear something in mind. However, there's a second part to that question, and the second part is this. Have you ever been asked to go somewhere by your parents that you didn't want to go But you went anyways because you got to listen to mom and dad, right? Hey, they took you with them. And you found out it actually was something that you did want to do. It turned out to be not as bad as you thought. In fact, it turned out to be pretty darn good. Now, maybe those are a little bit harder to think about and remember that kind of a time. But I certainly have plenty of those times where somebody said something to me about, hey, let's go do this thing. And I went, doesn't sound very good. I don't know that I want to do that. But because of who the person was who invited me and because of, you know, maybe some sense of obligation, I said, you know what, I'll go, I'll go. And I went. And you know what? It turned out it was actually pretty good. I'm glad that I went. So what changed? Did it turn out that maybe it wasn't so bad or did something else happen in there? Any ideas? I tend to think that when that kind of stuff happens, 
The problem isn't whatever it is that we're going to or whatever it is that they want us to do. It's what I'm thinking about it. Or another word for that, big word starts with A that I'm sure your parents talk about sometimes, is our attitude. You ever get talked about that, right? You've got a bad attitude. We're going to go do this thing. You've got to change your attitude, right? Sometimes that actually has more to do with what happens and how we feel about something than anything else. It's just our attitude towards it. Now today, we got to hear a message just a little bit ago where the angels in heaven were describing to John and he was seeing this great big picture, this amazing picture. And it was a picture of a city that came down out of heaven and it said that all God's people were going to live in this city. And some people go, ooh, that sounds really nice. But some people go, I don't know. I mean, it seems neat, but I don't know that that's a place I want to go and spend forever. Maybe it'll be nice to visit, but I don't know about that, right? And sometimes I think that has nothing to do with what the Bible tells us. It has to do with our heart, our attitude. Because the Bible tells us and Jesus tells us that our hearts sometimes don't want what we should want. Our attitude is kind of messed up, right? But what's the good thing about that? The good news about Jesus is that Jesus actually comes into our heart and starts to change it, right? So that if we trust and we say, okay, Jesus, I know you want me to go do something. It's not what I want to do, but I'm going to do it because you said so, that Sometimes in there, our attitude starts to change. And it turns out, not only is the thing not so bad, but it turns out it's actually pretty amazing. And it's because Jesus started to change our hearts so that we would want the things that he wants for us. Right? And so, as we go through the world, as you grow, you guys are still growing. I'm still growing too, believe it or not. As we grow, we pray sometimes that Jesus would continue changing our hearts so that we would want the things that he wants. In fact, we even prayed that today. Did you guys notice that? Right at the beginning of the service, in what's called the collect or the prayer of the day, we prayed that God would teach us his ways and he would give us a heart to actually like them and want them because we know that whatever God wants for us must be good, right? And so, oh, and actually you see what my hands are doing. What does that mean? That's right. It means it's time for us to pray. I think God wants us to pray about that again now. So let's fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads, and everyone repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for giving me all your good gifts. Help me to want those gifts and chase after them. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Good job. Thank you guys for coming up. We continue now with our hymn of the day.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours today. From God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we live in the aftermath of Jesus' resurrection, looking forward to the resurrection of our own bodies, the life everlasting, the question often comes, what's it going to be like? And lots of images start to creep into our mind. You see people sort of dressed in white robes with big white wings and harps and things sitting around on clouds. Or maybe we see amorphous spirit blobs just kind of floating around the cosmos, bumping into stuff or maybe moving through stuff. Part of an endless feast or a concert where we're bowing down in circles around a great big throne or perhaps just imagination running wild in all sorts of different ways. But that's not the image that the Holy Spirit gives to John in these final verses of his revelation. No, God's image of the eternal dwelling place of God, his image of the the bride of the Lamb, is a city. Most of us are fairly familiar with the city, and because of that, it can be a little bit confusing to consider that image for our eternity. Most of us don't usually associate the city with very positive things. Cities are a a crumbling remnant uh, of life gone by, abandoned buildings, worn down streets, broken and boarded up windows. They're a a carryover from past growth that has now been left to rot as, as people just kind of move on. Cities are places of strife. They're places of conflict. Especially here in America, as a a nation of immigrants, the hurts, the rivalries, the ancient hatreds that existed between nations somewhere else were transported here to sort of take over our neighborhoods. And all of that mixed with new cultures, new languages, new customs that didn't play nice together when they were living on top of one another in the cities. Cities tend to be places of darkness. And the bigger they are, the harder it gets for the light to make it all the way down to the streets where people live and operate. Cities are hotbeds of seedy sin, crime. Darkened by the grime of industry, cities almost become a a visual picture of the illness that seems to, to spread across this country through it like water. But it isn't all negative. Uh, In fact, there are people who think quite positively about the cities. Otherwise, nobody would still be living in them. In fact, for every person who holds a negative view of the city, it seems there are at least a couple more who see it in, in a positive, even romantic way. Cities are places of diversity, places of community, where close proximity with one another brings about understanding and togetherness in humanity in ways that they don't find anywhere else. I mean, where else can you easily live in a neighborhood where you are equally close with an African-American family and an aging Jewish couple, a single Puerto Rican woman along with her daughter and her mother, and a widowed Chinese shopkeeper? Cities are places of culture. They're places of beauty. Centers for art. Centers for theater, education. Ever since the very first city, those places have been known as havens for human engineering and accomplishment, where inspiration and innovation seem to begin. But I think for a community like ours, where we have just as many who have come to places like DeMott, Wheatfield, Hebron, and the rest in order to escape the cities, as those who were born and bred here, the question remains— If eternal life with God is life in a city, do I really want to live there? Well, the first way to answer that question is this. Like the rest of the book of Revelation, this isn't literal. This is figurative language that is being used here. It's meant to to stir up certain thoughts. It's meant to bring about certain emotions. It's meant to communicate truths about the church of God, but not in concrete, precise language. So if it doesn't literally mean a a city, like we're used to hearing it at least, then what is it saying? It's saying lots of things. For example, 
Did you notice that the city of New Jerusalem is described as a cube? Verse 16 says, The city lies four square. Its length and its width are the same. And then it goes on to say, Its length, its width, and its height are all equal. It's kind of a weird image for a city, don't you think? Length and width, maybe, yes, but, but height as well? Well, when the ancient temple existed in Israel, there was a, a special place at the heart of that temple. It was a place called the Holy of Holies. It was the room where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. It was the place where God's glory dwelled there with his people. It was a kind of a spiritual junction between heaven and earth. And that Holy of Holies was always built to be a perfect cube. And so this cubic city brings to mind that place so that we see that this new place, this new holy city, this new Jerusalem, is the new place where God's glory dwells. It is the new intersection between heaven and earth. And there are also all these detailed descriptions of the great walls adorned with 12 different jewels with names to represent all sorts of important figures, constructing an image in our minds that isn't unlike a crown. And the prophet Isaiah talks about God himself becoming a great crown of glory, a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. And there's other cool bits here too, but, but more than all that is what a city actually is. See, when people show pictures of some great city, they always show pictures of the skyline. They always show pictures of the buildings or whatever, but, but that's largely why we get the images I think we do in our minds when someone starts to talk about the cities, because that's what usually gets shown to us, but what really makes a city isn't the buildings. It isn't any of those things. It's not the architecture. It's not the streets. It's the people who live there. And the same is true for this new Jerusalem. Yeah, it's got walls. Yeah, it's got gates. It's got all that. That's what a city has. But it's not what a city is. A city is a large, massive, sometimes astronomically so, massive community of people, all living together with one another. And the Bible makes clear that the people of God are his remnant, his flock, his body, his church. And so if the new or the city, New Jerusalem, is meant to teach us something about the church, then what is it saying? Well, Note that right off the bat, what the city is called. In verse 9, an angel tells John, Come, and I will show you the bride. I will show you the wife of the Lamb. And then he goes off to show John this city. Hopefully we recognize by now that the Lamb is speaking of Jesus, the one who was sacrificed for the sins of God's people, and so the church is said to be his bride. It is given to him by God the Father as his prize for remaining faithful in all things, for fulfilling his calling as the Son of God. But more than just some kind of reward, that bride was bought and was bought at an extraordinary price, the price of his own blood, his own life, willingly, gladly paid on account of his great love and passion for her. We see that the gates of the city, the ways into it, are inscribed with the names of Israel's 12 tribes who were the first recipients of God's promises. As these promises were introduced in the Old Testament of God's Word, we see that those covenants become the entry point for the church's gathering and its formation. However, in verse 14, we see that it's the city's foundations upon which everything else rests that bear the inscriptions of the twelve apostles of Jesus. Those who are called by him and sent into the world to confess Jesus as the Son of God, as our Redeemer, our Lord, whose confession came to be our New Testament. And so interestingly enough, 
while it's the Old Testament promises that come first and sort of provide an entry point. It's the events of the New Testament. It's the witness of those apostles to all that Jesus said and did that holds all of it up, giving meaning, giving purpose to everything that happened in the Old. Verse 22 says that there is no temple there for God to dwell in because God is now present with His church everywhere. And verse 23 says there's no sun or moon, no great lights to light it up because we have a new lamp. The Lamb, Jesus Himself, is there to fill it with His light. And so in the eternal church there is no darkness. All is visible. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is secret. And with all that, maybe this idea of the new Jerusalem being the center focal point for the life everlasting isn't so bad after all. Suddenly, maybe we're now warming up to this idea of moving to the city if this is what we're talking about. But problems still arise because while the Bible paints this beautiful picture of the church of God and the Lamb, it doesn't seem to look like that now as we are in the church of the Lamb. The church is still filled with sinners. And sinners always find ways to diminish the reality of what God calls us to somehow. We bicker and fight. Feelings get hurt. Egos get bruised. We play favorites. We pick sides. We don't bear the burdens of being the church equally. And so all of those promises that are attached to New Jerusalem, they still feel very distant, sometimes making it hard for us to see them at all. And in some ways, we have to be honest, that we don't want to see it. We actually seem to prefer imperfection to perfection most of the time. The crumbling city of darkness and conflict holds a a certain appeal for us. We're naturally skeptical of anything that claims to be perfect, thinking it's scary or, or somehow wrong. And that's because we're made for this life, the imperfect life, the fallen life. And so these images of the church as something pure and pristine, something holy and unique, something righteous, something beautiful, They sometimes challenge and confront us more than comfort us. Because deep down we know that something so perfect, something so beautiful, isn't meant for someone like me. In fact, verse 27 says, Nothing unclean will ever enter the city, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. And deep down I know I have done what is detestable and false. I am unclean. We're unclean. And yet, God's Word says that we're in the city if we are one with the Lamb. Earlier in this very book, John sees a massive throng of people. He sees the church of God dressed in bright white robes, and he's told that they are only there because their robes have been washed, made white, made pure, made clean in the blood of the Lamb. That's the ticket to getting your name in the Lamb's book of life. And where does that happen? It happens right back there at the font. Where ordinary water and heavenly words intersect to unite you with Jesus, the Paschal Lamb, the one who bore the sin of the world and died to earn forgiveness for all of it. In baptism, you are united with Him in His death so that you know the blood He shed, He shed for you. So that you can trust in His righteousness, His faithfulness to His promises for you. In baptism, you are made clean. And just as we have been united with Him in a death like His, surely we will be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Once again, this is the promise of Easter. When Jesus rose from the dead to new life, to eternal life, and I am here to tell you today, 
that you who are baptized into faith in Jesus do not need to fear death because God has promised to raise you from the dead on the last day. A huge part of our hesitation or reluctance towards these kinds of images of the new creation, the new Jerusalem, the bride of the Lamb, comes because we have no choice but to look at it with these eyes. Unclean eyes, fallen eyes, trained by this life to desire this life, no matter how bad we know it is. But when God raises you from the dead on the last day, you will be given a new body, and yes, you will be given new eyes. Every cell in your body transformed for that life. So that not only will you be able to see it through transformed eyes, appreciate it with a transformed heart and mind, you will belong to it. A citizen in every way. And this image of the church, yes, it's hard for us to see. Now, I would say it's entirely invisible to our eyes. It is 100% here and real right now, though. It is here because of Jesus' promise, because of Jesus' work. But it can only be seen through the eyes of faith. But when the day comes, we won't need faith anymore. Because we'll see it for ourselves through transformed eyes, taking in every detail, every single word of those promises. And as the light of the Lamb, the light of Jesus, is cast upon every inch of it, we will finally see the fullness of the blessings of the city of God, His church, His people, His children for all eternity. And those more positive aspects of the city then, they're there too. And they get cranked up all the way to 11. The church will be a center for art, for culture, and beauty because Jesus has purged the sin that corrupts and spoils beauty in the world now and sends it from our midst. The first great city of the world, Babel, they worked together for themselves and their glory, stained with sin as it was, championing their brokenness. But in the last city... We will accomplish great things once more. But they won't be stained with sin. They will be for God's glory and for the blessing of all. And in that city, in the church of God forever, we will find a level of community and diversity that is unmatched anywhere in the world today. As we heard just a few weeks ago, it will be a great multitude that no one can number, no one can count from every nation, from every tribe, from every people, from every language. But for all of this diversity, there will be no division, no strife, no conflict. And that's because all of, for all of our uniqueness, all of our diversity, we will be made one, united always in Christ Jesus our Lord. For now, we wait for all of that to come. But we don't have to. As I said, that church is hard for us to see right now, but it is here. That unity in Christ is yours, even today. That opportunity to work together for good works that, that glorify God is yours even today. And that beauty is actually present in the church of the Lamb, even here, even now, for those with eyes of faith to see it. And so I urge you to take refuge in these walls. Continue learning more about the church and the good that you can do in it and through it. And know that as you do, you are helping to build that great and wondrous city for yourself, for your children, for your family, and for everyone else whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. One brick, one soul at a time. And may the peace that is beyond understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, the Lamb, as we are his bride now and forever. Amen. I now invite you to rise. As we confess our faith today using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which you can find printed on the inside back cover of your hymnals.
We confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. In that day, Jesus said that we would pray directly to our Father in heaven. This side of Easter and Pentecost, we know that all we ask is based on our Lord's death and His resurrection. Let us therefore take our concerns to our Heavenly Father. We pray that the Spirit would work faith in the hearts of many people who do not know about our Lord's overcoming the world through His death and resurrection. Grant that they would join us to pray to our Father in heaven, to hallow his name, and to be instruments of his kingdom and his will. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We pray for all people who call out to God for daily bread, everything that has to do with the support and needs of the body, those who are sick, in need of adequate food, clothing, or shelter, in conflict with family or neighbors, oppressed unjustly, dealing with calamity by fire or water, going into harm's way for the good of others, and those near and dear to us, especially Judy Brown, Roger Clark, Christine Hug. Brad Leith, Mel Pierce, Dennis Rinkenberger, and Nolan Schultz. Grant that they place their hope in Jesus' overcoming the world, realize God's protection and care, and find peace in God's answers to their prayers. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We pray for people who do not know the complete forgiveness for their trespasses that Christ has won for them and those who have strayed away from his protection into false belief and despair. Grant that God would surround them with people, bringing them his forgiveness in word and deed, so that they might overcome the devil, the world, and their own sinful nature to win the victory. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. 
We ask God to answer those prayers that we have not put into words, but are still known to him, our Heavenly Father. Hear us, O Lord, for the sake of the death and resurrection of your Son, in whose name we pray. Let all the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Amen. Yes, yes, it shall be so. now bring forward our tithes and our offerings. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give him thanks. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ the very paschal lamb who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death, and by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and your blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and to confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, 
your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You've received peace. Share that peace with one another.
Please rise. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Please be seated for a few announcements. <clears throat> uh, busy day today at 2.30 this afternoon. Uh, we will be at Oak Grove leading a worship service for the residents there. Uh, anyone who would like to join us for that is certainly welcome. It's a good chance for us to visit with some of our members uh, who reside there, people we haven't gotten to see here in a long time. Uh, it's also just a, a nice visit for them or a blessing for them to have uh, visitors to sort of share in the gospel. And so again, we'll be there today. Um, I actually put two o'clock in the bulletin because that's about the time that we'll start getting there, but we'll start the service at about 2.30. Uh, and again, and that's over at Oak Grove. And then after that, later on today, starting at four o'clock is our paint party for those who purchased tickets for that. Um, if you have not purchased tickets for that, uh, we may still have some room. I know we actually have a couple of tickets available from people who purchased them and are not able to use them. And so um, if you're interested in that, please, please let me know and we'll see if we can work something out uh, to get in there. Otherwise, for those who purchase tickets, we will see you here at 4 p.m. I will be here. I'll be painting and, uh, and it'll be a, a nice, fun evening. In fact, I see Ernie back there. Ernie will be there too. So we'll, uh, we'll all be there painting and hanging out and having a good time together. So um, again, that starts at 4 o'clock today. Uh, what else do I have here? Oh, on Tuesday, this Tuesday at 7 p.m. will be our next prayer service uh, for the war in Ukraine. Um, it's a short service, maybe just under a half an hour, if that, um, with readings and uh, opportunities for prayer. We will also be receiving a free will offering for anyone who would like to give to the Lutheran churches in Ukraine uh, to help support them as they are taking care of their people uh, in the midst of this war. Again, that'll be this Tuesday at 7 p.m., uh, church workday is scheduled for Saturday, June 4th, beginning at 8 a.m. and going until about noon. Uh, we want to get together early so we don't have to worry about the sun getting too hot, but we got a number of uh, activities and work that needs to get done. John Meyer's here. You can ask him uh, if you have any questions about that. Uh, let's see. Then next week, there will be no Sunday school. We will still have Bible class, but we will not have Sunday school. And then after that, uh, the week after that, we're going to transition into our sort of summer Sunday school model, which is uh, all of the kids will kind of come together in one class uh, during that time. And so, again, no Sunday school next week. We will still have adult Bible class, summer Sunday school after that. Uh, we're still looking for help to sign up with uh, lawn care. The sign-up sheet is in the back there. Um, we actually have somebody new who's doing it uh, for the first time, and he's getting trained up this next week uh, and, and how to do that. So again, if you haven't done it before, but you're like, hey, I can help out and ride a mower and help clean things up around here, uh, please feel free to sign up. We're happy to train anybody who's interested in sharing that load. That's all I have in terms of announcements. I don't know if anybody else has anything they'd like to share. Yes, Karen. Perfect. Sen yep, senior birthday lunch, noon tomorrow here at the church. Oh, we got a busy week to this week then. All right. Thursday morning at 9, our uh, Pew Sisters Bible study will be meeting. Anyone else? All right. Well then, blessings on your day. We'll see you in Bible class. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.